Good day, Crime Talk aficionados. My name is Scott Reich, and this is Crime Talk. Thanks for joining us. We have a great show for you today. First, some new facts from the uh, Delphi motions hearing. What was going through Chad Dorman's mind when uh, he decided to execute his three sons? Will the DA uh, fold in regards to the Karen Reed case? The Gilgo Beach suspect wants to sever his cases, and an attorney has been arrested for trying to buy babies from prisoners. We have some new footage of the guy who drove his car through the nail salon, killing four. Yeah, it looks like he was drunk before he stopped at the liquor store. That means problems. And an America's Most Wanted found as a, serving as a police officer, and then finally, our dumb criminal of the day. Let's talk about it. Good day, everyone. You know the drill. Subscribe if you haven't, like if you do, leave me a comment below, and remember to hit that little bell for notifications of when we go live or put up new content. And it seems like a lot more of you are listening to the podcast as well. We appreciate that. You can listen to all of the uh, back uh, shows as well. You know, if you're on the road, maybe out for a walk, yeah, go to your favorite podcasting app, Crime Talk with Scott Reich. And um, you can also, there's an app as well, the Crime Talk with Scott Reich app, where you can get all of the videos and podcasts all in one convenient location. So check that out as well. All right, before we get to the um, docket today, we gotta pay some bills. So how do we do that? Well, we have a sponsor for today. Go to U.S. Gold Trust, ladies and gentlemen. As you may have heard, the stock market has been diving right? Stock market's down, you know, two, three, four, five percent, uh, about a trillion dollars in assets lost. Well, guess what? I'm looking here at gold and it's down, but it's down less than one, one tenth of one percent. Uh, so it's still worth about twenty four hundred dollars per ounce, ladies and gentlemen. And guess what? People rally to gold when things go bad, when the dollar's not worth anything people go to gold, substantial assets. So go to US Gold Trust, check them out, hit the link below. You're going to fill out some simple information. One of their representatives is going to contact you and you're going to get some information. It's no hard sell. You just simply talk with them. You decide whether you want to roll over some of your retirement into precious metals. Now I guarantee you, if you had precious metals, you'd probably have more value today than you did than what's in the stock market. Because if you're like me, you're down considerably today. But I have my hedging gold as well. So go to the uh, link below, check them out, talk with them. If you decide it is best for you, it's in your best interest to do that, then you can go forward. No pressure, doesn't cost you anything. Just talk to people that know what they're talking about. All right, let's go ahead and get to the docket today for August 5th, 2024. And first on the docket, some new facts in the Delphi homicide case. The Delphi murder suspects, lawyers claim that a pagan cult sacrificed two teenage girls who were snatched from a hiking trail and that the alleged confessed killer is innocent. So as you've if you've been following the story, you know that Libby German and Abby Williams disappeared on February 13th of 2017 while hiking on the Monon High Bridge Trail in Delphi, Indiana. Now, Richard Allen has been charged with their murders, and he was arrested back in October of 2022 after police linked a round, a bullet round found at the crime scene to his gun. A lot of the details um, have not been revealed about this case over the last seven years, which obviously opens up a lot of speculation because they don't give us a copy of the discovery, ladies and gentlemen. A lot of times the best information comes from the pleadings themselves and motions hearings. Anyway, they just finished up three days of motions hearing last week and the Carroll County Court heard the girls were found with their throats cut, branches laid on top of their remains, and Abby's body wearing Libby's clothes. Now, if you've been watching Crime Talk for a while, you knew that because we went through the motions for a James hearing months and months ago. And frankly, um, there's a lot more information that came out in those pleadings 
than what came out in these particular motions hearings. But for those who don't watch every show and watch our every live show, this is why we bring it to you. So as we know, Abby and Libby set out on the trail to hike about 1.35 p.m. and Libby posted a photo at about 2.07 p.m. of Abby walking along the bridge. Now police believe they were kidnapped at about 2.14 p.m. and that they were both killed within about 18 minutes from when uh, they were kidnapped. Now prosecutors told the court that Allen confessed to the murders more than 60 times in jail phone calls to his wife and mother as well as to another inmate. Now, the uh, prosecutors, Nicholas McClellan, also claimed that Allen's intent was to sexually assault when he allegedly kidnapped the girls. Now, Allen's lawyers, led by Bradley Rossi, claimed the confessions were the result of his degraded mental state due to being locked in solitary confinement. They last year named four other people as members of a cult to the Norse god Odin, arguing the girls were killed in a ritualistic sacrifice. Well, the Indiana State Police Detective Brian Harshman testified about the confession after listening to 150 hours of phone calls. Ladies and gentlemen, how many times have I told you? How many times I have told this story? We tell clients every time, don't talk about the facts of the case on the phone. Heck, all you have to do is arrest somebody these days and then just go listen to the phone calls because the first thing they do is call their family members and talk about the facts of the case, okay? And how many times have we said this, ladies and gentlemen? Usually, if a defendant gets convicted, it is his own words that get him convicted, all right? That is what's going to happen in this particular case. And I don't know if Mr. Allen did it or not. I wasn't there. But the reality of it is people don't generally confess to crimes they didn't commit. Now, I want to hear the context of those calls. We haven't been able to hear those. I would like to know if he was so mentally distraught, if that was the case. But that's a question of fact. I'd want to hear the calls in their entirety. But if he's confessing, he's done, ladies and gentlemen. So I know It'll never happen to you. I know it'll probably never happen to anybody you love, but if it's just on a slight chance it does, and they call you from jail, don't talk about the facts of the case from jail. Anyway, the detective said that the confessions began um, late March 2023 after he had come to a Jesus moment, and Alan spoke very specifically about details of the crime and why he did what he did. Allegedly, of course. Well, an Indiana State Police Lieutenant, Jerry Holloman, also testified that an inmate alleged Allen confessed to him as well and revealed the murder weapon. Allen allegedly uh, told the inmate he murdered the girls with a box cutter and then dumped it in a dumpster outside a CVS. I think he worked at a CVS if my mind is uh, not escaping me here. Anyway, defense lawyers want the confessions thrown out because they're a product of Allen's mental breakdown while being treated like a prisoner of war in jail. The defense brought in a psychologist contracted by the Indiana Department of Corrections to testify in support of that argument. Now, Rossi's team instead points the finger at the four Odinists, including the father of Abby's boyfriend at the time of her death. Now, Don Polarmetter, he is an alleged expert on ritualistic crimes, testified that this crime scene is a textbook for ritualistic murder. Now, she claimed the crime scene had seven indicators of Odinistic ritualistic killings, including the position of the branches on the body. Now, Perlmutter said she reviewed autopsy records, crime scene photos, and social media posts, some of the alleged Odinists. And when asked if he had any doubt uh, the girls were sacrificed in a pagan ritual, she replied, none. Well, McClellan moves to discredit her testimony by noting that she came to the conclusion in a court TV report last year before she saw any of the evidence in this particular case. He asked her what her response would be if the alleged killer said the intent was a sexual assault. Now, the prosecutor also contested her theory that the branches were laid on the bodies uh, to form a runic symbols, noting that Allen said that the branches were there to cover the girl's body. Now, Perlmutter argued that blood smeared on a tree in one leaked crime scene photo was painted to form the letter F, which is significant in North mythology. But a, a blood specialist, a guy by the name of Patrick Cicero, and a forensic expert from the LaPorte County Sheriff's Office 
said it was more likely transfer stain from Libby's bloody hand. Now, purposely painting a symbol on the tree would have involved the killer repeatedly dipping their hand um, in blood, according to the expert. Now, Perlman admitted that there was no physical evidence tying any of the four men to the crime scene. Other witnesses claimed one or more of the supposed Odinists also confessed to killing the girls. Now, Kevin Murphy, a retired Indiana State police officer who worked on the case from 2017 to 2019, told the court there was undeniable link between Delphi and the Odinist cult in nearby Rushville. He said police believed the murders were the work of two of six people, and he focused on the alleged cultist Elvis Fields. Now, Murphy told the court Fields' sister gave very specific information that only someone at the crime scene would know. In the recorded call with her brother, she blurted out, Elvis, why did you kill those girls? Fields denies the accusation to police, but Murphy said he asked them if he would get in trouble if his spit was found on the girls. Brad Holder, the father of Abby's girlfriend and accused Odinist, was another person Allen's defense team zeroed in on. His ex-wife Amber Holder testified that Holder told her a third alleged cultist, Patrick Westfall, confessed to killing Abby, but she acknowledged Holder was drunk when he relayed the story to her. She claimed he told her to keep my mouth shut, and if I didn't, they'd kill me. Amber told the court that Holder had a special knife he used to cut hands during Odinist rituals, which could be, in fact, the murder weapon. Now, the former Rushville Police Department officer, Todd Click, who helped with the investigation, told the court that he believed the Odinist theory. He said his theory was the girls interrupted a pagan ritual and were killed for it. He also believed Holder and Westfall were on the trail that day, but there was no smoking gun physical evidence tying them to the crime scene. Click told the court he was shocked and confused when Allen was charged and uh, not any of the four other alleged Odinists. Now, Holder was cleared by the main investigation based on an alibi of him clocking out at work at the landfill site about a half hour from the Delphi at 2.45 p.m. when the crime was believed to have occurred at 2.30 between and 3.30 p.m. He then used a key fob to get into a gym in Logansport at 4.08 p.m. Now, prosecutors have asked Judge Gull to throw out all testimony claiming the Odinists were responsible and to ban the theory from the trial. Now, she has yet to rule on this particular theory. And so here's the thing, ladies and gentlemen, a lot of people think, and I've had to explain this to a lot of clients over the years, well, why can't you just throw that out there? It doesn't matter what you believe, it matters what you can prove. And when these witnesses say, hey, I think, or I believe that these Odinists were at this crime scene, you have to have something more than I think or I believe. It doesn't matter what you think or what you believe. You have to be able to show and prove what you know. And if you can't do that, it's usually not admissible in the court of law. And for an alternate suspect, you have to be able to say that the suspect was actually in the area and could, in fact, been there to commit the crime during that particular moment. Now, don't get me wrong. I would love for the judge to allow this in. I think it would create probably reasonable doubt as it relates to Mr. Allen, if the jury is not completely convinced that he didn't confess. However, I'm going to give you my experienced attorney opinion. I think the judge will keep this Odinistic, ritualistic killing out of the mix. And the reason being is nobody can actually place somebody there. People saying, oh, we have multiple levels of hearsay where somebody's saying somebody else told me something and that was it. There's no physical evidence tying them to the location. There's nothing to say that these people have acted previous and this is the previously acted in bad ways, like i.e. killing other girls. And then therefore this must be them. Like there was some signature or something along those lines. It's interesting. Don't get me wrong. And if I was the guy's defense attorney, I would be running with this all day long. But I think the judge will keep it out. I know we're going to have to wait and see what happens. Did I get it right? Did I get it wrong? I don't know. I think she keeps it out. Even though the defense has a right to present a defense, to present a theory, sometime no matter how cockamamie it may be, but the judge is the gatekeeper of that. And in this particular situation, I think she's going to keep it out.
Stay tuned. Next on the docket, what was going through Chad Dorman's mind before he decided to execute his three boys? Well, days after Chad Dorman admitted murdering his three young sons with a rifle and was sentenced to spend the rest of his life in prison without the possibility of parole, prosecutors held a brief press conference revealing some shocking additional evidence. Uh, in the case, uh, one of their own called the worst crime that they had ever seen. Now, there's now a little bit clearer picture of what the 33-year-old um, killer said and did in the days and hours before the family uh, was executed, his three sons, not his wife and not his stepdaughter, but his three biological sons. Well, the Claremont County prosecuting attorney, Mark Ticolvi, uh began his presentation by revealing that several days before the murder, Dorman took his sons, Clayton 7, Hunter 4, and Chase 3, out for a boys' day at a dirt track and also went fishing with them. Then, the day before the murders, he woke his 14-year-old stepdaughter Alexis up um, in the morning and apologized to her for, well, anything that he'd ever done to hurt her, an incident that um, everyone kind of described as very unusual. That night, he coached third base at his son's uh, baseball game. Finally, on the day of June 15th, 2023, the day of the murders, Dorman searched YouTube's uh, for the song Happy in Hell. And at lunch that afternoon, after he got home from work early, he told his then wife, Laura Dorman, that this will probably be my last good meal. Nothing really seemed amiss or abnormal at work. And Dorman, an insulator, uh, he worked as a union insulator, uh, would give conflicting statements about whether he really had trouble sleeping in the lead up up to the horrific crimes. Although he told his mother that he was having some confusing feelings, she didn't call his wife or 911 or a crisis hotline, according to the prosecutors. Instead, she suggested that he go to the little clinic inside the Kroger in Claremont County. And when he went there uh, on June 15th, after leaving work about 9.30 a.m., it seemed from the video that uh, no one was at the desk. In any event, it was not the right place to go for feelings you may have um, it's not, okay, in any event, it was not the right place to go for feelings you may have um, been having, uh, like, you know, you want to kill your family. Anyway, the video does show Dorman walking into Kroger's wearing the same clothes he was wearing when he was arrested. He walked through the vitamin aisle, folded his arms and looked at some uh, vitamins, uh, but didn't buy anything. He walked over to the little clinic and leaned on it, waiting there for a minute or two and then walked away. On the way home, he picked up a 16-ounce can of Bud Light, and after he got back to the um, residence, his family returned from running some errands. His sons were happy to see him, and they actually played together. Then, while eating lunch prepared by Laura, Chad said, this will be my last good meal, which she worried was a suicidal statement. And then prosecutors further said that the evidence showed that Chad Dorman called his father and said, Clayton's going to be the hardest. Dorman even read the Bible to Hunter, mumbled to himself, Chad knows what's right, and told his son around 4 p.m. that he loved them and that they did nothing wrong. When the family went into the bedroom for an afternoon nap, Chad jumped out of the bed and grabbed the rifle from the gun safe. In this moment, the prosecutor said Laura believed he was going to kill himself. Chad apparently grabbed Laura's phone when she tried to call 911 and told her it's too late. A short time later, prosecutors played the distressing 911 call of Laura screaming for help, and uh, you could hear gunshots in the uh, recording as well. The dispatcher on the other end repeatedly told Laura to calm down, that she wasn't understanding what was happening. And then, of course, we had the body cam video from that day that shows Dorman was waiting on the front step for deputies to show up on the residence to arrest him with the rifle right next to him. Now, when the deputies uh, responded to the murder scene, they took Dorman uh, to the ground and placed him in handcuffs while he was face down. One of the deputies asked him, what are you doing, man? Dorman turned his head and said, can I roll over? Uh, I ain't going to hurt uh, y'all. I ain't going to hurt nobody. After again being asked what was going on, Dorman replied, nothing. Can I stand up? It's kind of uncomfortable. Well, video recorded after Dorman was uh, taken into custody also showed that he was uh, banging his head against the wall while he was in custody. Anyway, well, the judge that was handling this case ruled back in March that the full admission that Dorman made in custody had to be suppressed because the detectives failed to properly advise Dorman of his Miranda rights and continued to ask questions after he had asked for an attorney. That was good for him, but it 
there were lots of eyewitnesses, so it really didn't happen. It really didn't matter in the long run. Then the defense shifted their plea to a not guilty by reason of insanity defense, and then the defense that's uh, the defense then said that he was in the state of psychosis on the day of the murders. As you know, last week he pled guilty to aggravated murder and felonious assault charges, the latter two crimes for wounding Laura Dorman with gunfire. She tried to save her children from an attack on the daughter as well, who was in the living room. Uh, when the shootings began. So after addressing the evidence uh, from the shooting, the prosecutors reiterated that their view that Dorman knew what he was doing during and after the murders, no doubt in my, my humble opinion, for whatever it's worth, because the prosecutors say that 12 days after the murders during a jailhouse visit with his brother, Dorman compelled himself to Hitler, as in Hitler made global news and so did he and he did not express any remorse. Now, with the support of the surviving victims, the state and the defense reached a plea agreement that took the death penalty off the table in exchange for life without parole and also putting the end to the um, litigation that would take place as it relates to this mental health issues. Um, so that case is finally resolved. Now, Dorman's now ex-wife said she's fine with it no matter what the sentence was going to be obviously wasn't going to bring her three children back her daughter's completely traumatized by the incident as is she so i think she just wanted to move on uh from it and i get that and but that's one of the things that you can do ladies and gentlemen when you have the death penalty it is a bargaining tool a lot of people will say we don't want to go through this take the death penalty off and we'll plead guilty a lot of states though take it away but We've said, at what point should you just get a, I don't know, like a Costco discount for for committing volume of crime? Um, doesn't make sense. You don't get a volume discount for committing crime. Things should get worse. Something to think about. Next, the Karen Reed case. Um, I don't know. Is the prosecutor going to fold to the defense in this particular case? We're going to have to wait and see. But the prosecutors basically made a filing late Friday, letting everybody know that uh, four jurors in the Karen Reed murder trial uh, contacted the Norfolk County District Attorney's Office with one saying that Reed was unanimously acquitted on two charges and that she was accused of, of the charges she was accused of, including murder. The assistant district attorney received an unsolicited voicemail and three emails from an alleged juror on Sunday, July 21st, who claimed it's true that um, what has come out recently about the jury being unanimous on charges one and three. And then on Friday, July 26, prosecutors say that uh, the uh, prosecutors received another unsolicited voicemail from the same individual stating can confirm unanimous on charges one and three as not guilty and as of last vote, 9-3 guilty on the manslaughter charges on the lower level manslaughter charges. Now, the prosecutor's office didn't respond to the jurors due to ethical violations about the juror deliberation process. And the DA office also claimed that prior to that, they had received three emails from individuals identifying themselves as jurors who wanted to speak anonymously. And then on July 16th, the uh, Commonwealth reportedly responded to the email stating that they would welcome the opportunity to discuss the evidence or the Commonwealth's case. However, we are ethically prohibited from inquiring as to the substance of your jury deliberations. That would include your individual or the jury's collective thought process, the content of your deliberations, or the reasons for your decisions. All three alleged jurors declined further communications after saying the DA's office couldn't promise their confidentiality. Ethically, the prosecutors are doing what they have to do. Do they have to dismiss you know, the counts where the jury said one and three? No, the verdict was never officially taken. I know there's one case out there that allows them to do that. Now, if the justice requires such, um, the DA can decide if that's what they're gonna do. I don't see the judge imposing not guilty verdicts on that. And um, the reality of it is, ladies and gentlemen, nobody asked. Nobody asked if they had reached a decision on the verdicts. They basically just assumed, because the notes were very articulate, well-written, and stated we were hung. They didn't say we were hung on one of the three counts. 
they made it sound like they were hung on all of them. So now everybody wants to have their cake and eat it too. The one who really, I mean, the judge says, fine, mistrial, defense asks for mistrial, you got it. Prosecution was like, no, don't do it. They got the mistrial. Each jury is different. To say that the charges should be dismissed, that's a decision the prosecutor will have to make. I don't think it's one for the judge, uh, but each case is different. I've, like I said, had cases where it's been a hung jury and, you know, guess what? You go back and do it again and they all come back guilty. So each jury is different. There's personalities involved, lots of different things that can take place. I don't think Karen Reed, I think Karen Reed is going to go back and we're going to do the tr same trial all over again. We'll just have to uh, see what the judge decides in an upcoming hearing. <laughs> Next on the docket, Rex Huerman. That's right. Have to bring out our Rex Huerman shirt. Dun, 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 dun. There it is. The pizza's amazing, but make sure you finish the crust. I love that. That's funny. It's kind of like lawyer, lawyer, lawyer. They got him for genetic genealogy. Don't leave your DNA anywhere, ladies and gentlemen. It could get you charged with those murders that you've allegedly committed. Anyway, Rex Heuerman, the guy that's charged with six murders, including the so-called Gilgo Four, appeared for a status hearing uh, late last week. Now, the architect's attorneys argued in court that the uh, minimum, the newest charges, the death of Sandra Costilla and the 1993 that's in 1993, and Jessica Taylor in the 2003 case should be severed from the Gilgo Four. They have nothing to do with the other four, the attorney argued, and there's nothing, no relevance to the four cases together. The MO is different, the way the murders were allegedly carried out was completely different, and the way that the bodies were deposited, for lack of a better word, are different. Now, prosecutors filed a superseding indictment in June charging Heuerman uh, with the deaths of Castillo and Taylor. He was previously charged with the deaths of Melissa Bartholome, going back to 2009, Megan Waterman in 2010, Amber Costello in 2010, and Maureen Brainerd Barnes in 2007. Now, the district attorney, Ray Tierney, reiterates that uh, Heuerman is also the suspect in the deaths of Valerie Mack, who disappeared in 2000, and who remains were found um, in 2000 and 2011 near the spot where Taylor's remains were found in Manorville. The prosecutor also stated that he disagreed splitting the case against Heuerman, saying there were reasons why we would want to try these cases together. Now, principally, he says, well, judicial economy, because he doesn't want to have to do it again. You tie up the courts, you tie up all their witnesses, you tie up the prosecutors, the police, the detectives, the family members, the jury, like, let's just do it once but there has to be some relevant nexus to all those so that it doesn't become too prejudicial under Rule 403, under the, the rules of evidence. So anyway, the uh, prosecutor said, we anticipate there will be lots of pretrial motions in these cases. Uh, there are a lot of pretrial motions in most cases. Actually, not true. But um, in this case, it's going to be a lot. Anyway, defense counsel said they anticipated possibly filing a motion to sever at some point when they get through all of the discovery. So here's the thing, ladies and gentlemen, there's a thing called compulsory joinder. You can't piecemeal all of your cases together and say, all right, defendant is charged in County A with crimes, and then there's County B. Well, we're only gonna charge him with County A, but then we'll coordinate and we'll, we'll wait, and then when he gets done with here, we'll, we'll get him with another case. They have a duty to bring them all together if they can. It's called compulsory joinder. But the defense is going to say, we want to sever these. We want these cut out because, like they said, there's no similarities in these whatsoever. Now, my guess is there may be some DNA. That's the similarity that everyone's going to say. The DNA is there, so let's do this trial once. But the reality is we're going to have to wait, okay? Every time you have a defendant with multiple homicide cases, you would like to keep them away from each other. All right, do them separately. The argument being that the defendant has a right to have a trial based upon these particular allegations and these allegations alone. If you're just throwing all this stuff in, it's prejudicial and it's not going to be a fair process. But when there is certain similarities, the way things are done, then it comes in as 404B evidence. So if you did them all separately, guess what? you'd have to hear all the same evidence 
four times in the trials as well, in the four separate trials. So at that point, yes, judicial economy makes sense to just do them all together. But there has to be some nexus between them all, some similarity, not just it's all the same defendant. So we'll see what takes place in the future. You know, I wish we got a copy of the discovery in all these cases, because then I could tell you exactly if it was worth trying to sever or just say, let's go do this thing. Next on the docket, an attorney gets arrested in Texas for buying babies? Yeah. So an, a, a Texas adoption attorney allegedly tried to buy two babies from incarcerated women by putting money in their commissary accounts, you know, so they can buy ramen, you know, toiletries, uh, candy bars, everything that you, you don't get in jail, but you can buy through commissary. It's kind of a scam. It's always marked up. But hey, when you, you have nothing, 20 bucks in your commissary goes a long way. So anyway, the attorney is a woman by the name of Jody Hall. We'll give her the presumption of innocence, but she's facing two charges of sale of purchase of a child, a third degree felony punishable by up to 10 years in prison. Now, according to the arrest affidavit, the Tarrant County Sheriff's Office obtained communications between Ms. Hall and a 29-year-old pregnant inmate via her jail tablet. And these emails went back to uh, March 13th. In the messages, Hall introduces herself as the director of the adoption agency that you have signed with and asks her to call her. Now, Hall adds that uh, she has cash for your commissary. And over the next few months, Ms. Hall continued to speak to the inmate about adoption, including asking whether her boyfriend would sign a document relinquishing all of his parental rights. You kind of need that for the adoption to go through. However, the relationship seemed to sour uh, over time between the inmate and Miss Hall. Quote, I don't need birth moms that lie to me just to get financial support, Miss Hall allegedly wrote. I can't give you any more if he's not willing to sign the paperwork. That means he wants the baby if he's the father. Well, the detectives determined that Miss Hall had put $846 into the commissary account to the uh, female inmate. And according to Texas law, it is legal for prospective adoptive parents to pay for medical and housing expenses for expectant mothers putting up their babies for adoption. But the law says the uh, cash given by uh, Hall does not meet those standards because the Tarrant County incurred those expenses since the mother was an inmate at the jail. So Hall allegedly became upset in early May. The inmate changed her mind and decided to keep her baby after it was born. The attorney um, then went after the female in the legal, in the verbal sense, stating that you're just a drug addict and basically nobody loves you. Uh, you're a scammer and I will be telling the prosecutor in your case all about how this family uh, supported you since November. You scam, you scam them with the help of your boyfriend. Now, Hall allegedly wrote, he's got pictures all over Facebook of him holding the baby. You are such a liar. Anyway, deputies arrested Ms. Hall on July 23rd, took her to the Hayes County Jail, where she has since bonded out. Ah, Does it sound like the most egregious thing that's ever taken place? No. Um, could you find a better place to maybe find adoptive parents or parents that want to give up their children for adoption? Sure, I guess. Um, I don't know. Let me know what you think. I mean, should the attorney be charged in that one? I mean, uh, I mean, clearly she was trying to curry favor with the inmate by giving that $849. And it wasn't permitted, so it's a violation of the law. Does it deserve a felony? Probably loss of her license? I don't know about that. Next, we got some new video of that drunk driver that drove through the um, Long Island Nail Salon. Yeah, take a look at this. This is video of the driver who has uh, been accused of driving his car into the nail salon there in New York. Now, the uh, footage shows the um, defendant, Stephen Schwally, looking a little uh, visibly disheveled as he purchased alcohol at the liquor store before embarking on his uh, deadly drive. Now, Schwally can be seen um, speeding through the parking lot, narrowly avoiding pedestrians in the footage. And um, then, obviously, uh, as he drives through the uh, Hawaii Nail and Spa in Deer Park on June 28th. Um, 
Now, a new video has even emerged of the moments leading up to the devastating crash that claimed four lives at the nail salon, including a, a woman getting her nails done before her wedding. So obviously what this video shows is he looks like he may have been impaired. And uh, guess what? You can't sell liquor to drunk people. So what does that do? That opens up exposure to the liquor store for supplying him alcohol when he was drunk, ladies and gentlemen. Here we call that dram shop type of cases where the liquor store or bars can be held responsible for selling to drunk people. The victim's families, I'm sure, have uh, received or obtained legal counsel. I'm sure they're very interested in that video and they're gonna go after that liquor store as well. Now, of course, the liquor store is gonna say, he may have bought it, but I couldn't tell that he was drunk and how do we know that he didn't not drink that bottle beforehand? Normally what happens is uh, when the criminal case is over, the civil cases begin, depositions are taken, and then you get to find out the truth. Terrible situation. Next, one of America's most wanted fugitives has been um, found working as a police officer. Please meet Antonio El Diablo Riano. Now, I think El Diablo means devil, if my Spanish serves me correctly. And well, Antonio is now 72 years old, and uh, he was arrested in Mexico bringing the end to a 20-year manhunt which was featured on America's Most Wanted. Now, the fugitive was found working as a police officer in his hometown of Mexico and uh, stated that he wanted to help the people of Mexico upon his arrest. Now, the Mexican native was charged with first-degree murder stemming from a 2004 shooting where he's accused of killing 25-year-old Benjamin Becerra in an Ohio bar. He was accused of gunning down Becerra at the Roundhouse Bar in Hamilton, Ohio, following a brief argument. And according to witness statements in the arrest affidavit, he shot Becerra, he shot Becerra point blank in the face before fleeing the scene. He was identified when police discovered he had purchased ammunition at Walmart just 45 minutes before the shooting. And when police searched um, Mr. Riano's home, they discovered a trove of false identities and uh, the murder weapon, a Smith & Wesson 380. They just happened to have two spent rounds. Anyway, but before justice could be served, El Diablo vanished in thin air. He managed to outrun the law for two decades, even as his face was broadcast on America's Most Wanted going back to 2005. But the law catches up with you. And when Mr. Rihanna was arrested in Mexico, he was found to be working as a police officer, according to the United States Marshal Service. Anyway, Rihanna was handed over to the U.S. Marshals in Mexico City and flown to Cincinnati, where he will face an arraignment. And guess what? The Mexican government would not let him come back here if he faced the death penalty. Not that this is probably going to be a death penalty case. I have seen cases where Mexico will say, we'll only send him back if you promise not to do the death penalty. And finally today, our dumb criminal of the day. Now, if you've had brothers and sisters, you've had fights. All right, let's face it. I remember just battling it out with my brothers in the basement over stupid stuff. Don't know why, but it got pretty serious at times. Anyway, take a listen to the account of this fight in South Carolina. Apparently, um, one of the participants told the brother um, why he didn't season the chicken so that it could uh, crust up. Seems like a reasonable inquiry, does it not? Well, according to police, <laughs> the police responded to a fight at the residence in Georgetown, which is a city about um, 40 miles south of Myrtle Beach. Police say that Anthony Harper was preparing chicken when his sister, Hope, and another person questioned him about the food seasoning. Anthony reportedly replied, I know how to cook and Grammy was going to season the chicken. In response, Hope, the sister, declared, you're not human. You're a dumb dog. Well, things got going from there. What followed apparently was a violent kitchen um, argument between the siblings. Now, during the uh, little fight, the two victims, including a third Harper sibling, were scratched on the arms. When the fight was in progress, Another man exited the kitchen and fired a 9mm handgun into the resident's ceiling, 
to try to make everybody stop and separate. It just didn't work. Anyway, Hope, the sister, then allegedly grabbed a steak knife and chased after her brother, who declared, she's going to kill me. At that point, the pair's grandmother exited her room, broom in hand, and waved it at Hope until she walked away and put the knife back in the kitchen. With his sister now unarmed, Anthony then grabbed a can of Raid, you know, the bug spray, and sprayed Hope in the face and neck. And then Hope, the sister, countered by seizing the bug killer and spraying Anthony across his entire body. <laughs> anyway, um, needless to say, uh, they pressed charges against one another. Of course they would. Uh, the scratch sibling, a 23-year-old woman, wanted Anthony arrested for leaving her with visible injuries on her arm. Anthony was charged with a pair of assault and battery counts, while his sister was busted on a single assault and battery charge. They were each released on their own bond, can't go home, can't have any contact. The interesting part was the guy that fired the warning shot into the ceiling didn't get charged. Nor did Granny, who came out with the broom. Could be considered a deadly weapon. You got to love those types of situations. But what does it revolve around? Food, ladies and gentlemen. What is it with food? Why are you not going to season the chicken so that it can crust up the way Granny makes it? Anyway, the Harpers, you are a dumb criminal of the day. Congratulations. You both made it. We'd have you together and maybe give you an award, but you can't. That protection order. Sorry. Maybe next time. See, you miss out on great opportunities in life when you break the law. All right, everybody. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Remember, the Constitution matters. Mm -hmm.